Uh, we'll get going here. So thank you again for joining uh, today's webinar hosted by Vicente Cedarberg, Waste Management Issues in the Cannabis Industry. So if we go on to the next slide, we can all introduce ourselves and then we can do a deep dive into today's topic. Uh, I'll start with myself because I'm talking and that makes sense. So hi, Michelle Bodian. I'm counsel with the law firm Vicente Cedarberg. I wear a couple of different hats here at the law firm, but as relevant today, I am chair of our environmental health and safety practice group, and I sit out of our Boston, Massachusetts office. Great panel here today. We've got Adam, Jake, Brandon, and Garrett. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, and then we'll get going into the presentation led off by Adam, uh, but might as well go down the headshot order. So if I can ask Jake to come on and introduce himself. Sure. Hi, my name is Jake Mitchell and I work with Resource Innovations. I'm a sustainability consultant uh, working for the cannabis industry uh, and utilities to help cannabis become more energy efficient and more sustainable. And this is Phil, who's very needy and always wants to be on camera. Yeah, I don't know. We can bring props. OK. <laughs> Automatic crowd favorite. Um, Brandon, I don't know if you have any pets with you, but either way, do you mind introducing yourself? No, unfortunately not. Um, but I am Brandon Ray. I am a Senior Compliance Officer and Sustainability Program Coordinator at Native Roots Cannabis Co. Um, we're a vertically integrated company here in Colorado with about 20 stores around the states. And we also have three retail operations in Canada. So um, we have a pretty good perspective on the industry in those two environments. Perfect. Thank you. Garrett, if you wouldn't mind. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Garrett Rodewald. I am a COO and co-founder of Gaia Waste Revitalization. We are a cannabis waste management service provider uh, based here in California. Uh, we've been uh, in operation since 2016, so about five, uh, five six years of uh, direct cannabis industry experience. Perfect, thank you. And last but not least, Adam. Hello, everyone. Adam Weissman. Uh, I'm an engineer with uh, NSAFE. We're a Memphis, Tennessee-based firm. I'm out of the Connecticut office, uh, supporting uh, mostly industrial clients on uh, environmental health and uh, safety issues. Perfect. And Adam, since you came off mute, I am going to ask you to stay that way, and we can start with today's presentation. So each of the panelists will do a brief presentation. Like I said, we'll leave time for discussion and questions at the end. Okay, very, very good. Uh, I'm going to get started. Let me just uh, here. Uh, I'm going to move along quickly. I have quite a few slides, but I want to give people just a, a basic introduction to some uh, waste management concepts and ideas and get a feel for, uh, you know, uh, hazardous waste, etc. So I want to talk a little bit about some introduction, waste determinations, I'll give you a feel for uh, some labeling and storing and shippings. And uh, I want to give a couple takeaway lessons and some things that we've seen in the field uh, with clients who, uh, you know, generate regulated waste materials. Next. So a, a takeaway right off the bat here is that, and I know for the folks on, on the uh, call, a webinar this morning, this afternoon, um, folks are producing different types of waste. Some of these wastes are potentially hazardous waste. I'm going to get a feel and help you understand what defines a hazardous waste. But we also are generating non-hazardous waste. Uh, we are generating uh, and can be generating the universal waste uh, and even potentially uh, used oils. And, and again, I, not even included on the slide, municipal solid waste and recyclables. So there are quite a, a broad range of types of waste generated and the level of regulation varies from waste to waste. Next. So, what, just to give folks a feel for what an EPA definition of a hazardous waste, universal waste. So generally, a uh, hazardous waste is defined by the uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and individual states. Uh, individual states are typically authorized to uh, implement their own hazardous waste programs, um, but, but that's not always the case. And a state can go beyond the federal requirements. So as long as they minimum, at a minimum, meet the federal requirements, they can ask for additional requirements. And we see this regularly as different states uh, wanna add sort of their own additional requirements uh, that they feel is appropriate for some of the state issues that they may have. Next. So uh, another term that folks may or may not have heard on this call is RECRA, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Um, this was federal legislation which uh, assisted in defining hazardous waste and hazardous waste 
uh, management. There was many cases of, of very, very poor management, Love Canal, things that go back several decades now. But these general regulations uh, were designed to uh, help folks and help uh, industry and generators protect human health and the environment, to uh, reduce waste, conserve energy, uh, you know, uh, obviously encourage recycling, and also to minimize the generation of these hazardous waste. There are ways that you can actually uh, minimize your generation of hazardous waste as opposed to once you generate, you have to handle it. Next. So one of the things I wanted to make sure that at least folks went away with at least this much was this concept of a hazardous waste determination. And this, you can take off the word hazardous if you want, but th this is the concept of a waste determination. Uh, and, and the important takeaway here is that the person who generates the waste must determine if the waste is hazardous or, or in a case it could be non-hazardous or how it has to be handled so that you don't go to a regulatory handbook and look up to see exactly if this waste is hazardous. You actually have to sort of make a determination and that's a process. And I wanted to share that process with folks a little bit today. So if you're gonna make a decision, decision is, is this waste a, a hazardous waste? First of all, is it a solid waste? And that's, that's a term that uh, actually includes liquids. It can actually include a gas. So uh, think about, you know, if you're generating a material that you no longer need, you cannot use, um, and you need to get rid of it, 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 it probably meets the definition of a, of a solid waste. There are some things that are excluded from waste regulation. For instance, if I was doing uh, generating scrap metal and that scrap metal is then going for legitimate recycling, if I'm generating, for instance, a plastics, which are going for legitimate recycling, they can be excluded from waste regulations as a recyclable material. And then you're gonna get into some of the more meat around hazardous waste. Is this a listed waste? Does it exhibit any characteristics? And I wanna share some of that next. So again, when should this determination be made? Now, ideally this is made early on in the process, but to sort of just to, to, to say, once you have determined that you no longer need the material, you've determined that it's a hazardous waste, or well, I should say you've determined that it's a waste. So if you're using a solvent, if you're using a paint, if you're using a chemical, it's not a waste. But at some point when you say, hey, I can't use this anymore, I now have a waste material. So that's a takeaway that it's, it, the determination is that it's a waste when you decide it's a waste. Next. So back to this hazardous waste uh, determination, you know, you have to, identify all your waste, get a feel for what are the inputs of this waste, what are its characteristics, what is it composed of, would it be excluded, would it meet the definition of hazardous waste, and these are some of the things that go into determining if you have a hazardous waste or indeed what is the regulation associated with that waste. Next. There's a lot of non-compliance around hazardous waste determinations. Um, very often generators of waste fail to make an accurate determination. Um, and they just, they don't understand the rules, they're not aware of the rules, et cetera. Next. These determinations actually should be captured in writing and you can make this very simple and there's forms you can get online, but you really should, as you have a waste that you're generating, uh, understand and, and make the determination, document the determination and, and, and you can actually list how you're gonna handle it at the end based on your determination, next. Um, you can put a sticker like this. We, 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 uh, this is okay if you need to do this. If there was a situation where you needed to do an analysis of a waste and a regulator said, hey, I, you have these drums. What are these? Are, are these hazardous waste? You could say, well, no, I'm sampling them. They're on hold because they're pending analysis. So that's okay too. You can actually have a waste pending analysis up, up to a point. You can't do this forever. Next. The characteristics that would typically make something a hazardous waste, you can see on this slide, but things that are flammability, corrosivity, reactivity, is it a toxic, um, you know, does it exhibit characteristics? And again, these are defined by regulation. Next. Here's some things that would be typically hazardous waste. And one of the big takeaways I think from this slide is, you know, if you have an organic solvent, a flammable liquid, it is almost always a hazardous waste. So if you're generating uh, a spent solvent, it's almost always a hazardous waste. But here's some other ones, certain discarded. If you're discarding even a, a commercial product, it could be a hazardous waste, high or low pH materials, things that contain heavy metals or pesticides. These are things that could be hazardous waste and typically are. Next. 
Uh, I just wanted to share these generated classes. I think for most people, uh, you're gonna be a very small quantity or a small quantity generator of hazardous waste, but those are only hazardous waste on this slide. So a very small quantity generator is less than 220 pounds a month. So less than a few drums of hazardous waste per month. And this helps you regulatorily to be in a smaller class. Next. Uh, another takeaway that I think folks are probably familiar with, you don't wanna miss mix non-hazardous and hazardous waste, okay? It's like the concept, if I have a beautiful uh, jug of wine and I put a few drops of poison in the wine, well, the whole jug of wine is ruined and it becomes hazardous. So uh, you really wanna do have segregation of your waste and this promotes recycling, reuse. As folks know what recycling, if you don't keep things separate, you can't recycle them. So you don't wanna mix your waste. Next. Uh, again, RECRA has a lot of rules around uh, requirements for storage. And you know it can be complicated, but you do have to have storage requirements, there are inspection requirements, there are training requirements, and this is dependent on how much waste you're generating. Uh, next. Uh, another takeaway I wanted to share quickly as I move through the slides is satellite accumulation. So this is where you're generating a small quantity of a hazardous waste at a workstation or at a place where it's being generated. Next. Here's an example, someone's generating a flammable waste liquid and they have it, and in this case, you can see it's in a safety can and they're identifying that it's hazardous waste. It's not gonna be shipped in this container, but they're generating it at the workstation in this container. Next. Um, and in those satellite areas, again, should be kept in good condition. Things need to be closed. You need to use a proper appropriate containers. You should not be generally reusing uh, shipping containers. You should, especially if it's a flammable material, uh, things need to be closed. That's a takeaway for these types of materials and labeled. Uh, next. So another very brief, I just wanted to share the idea of, of an empty container. Uh, and you can see that on the slide. So it's uh, for a container of less than 110 gallons, no more than one inch residual or 3% by total weight. So for a 55 gallon drum or, or smaller container. And again, you need to commonly empty the container by pouring, pumping, uh, aspirating out, you know, you got to make an effort to empty the container, but it doesn't mean it's 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 wiped down with a rag. Next, empty aerosols. Uh, that's another one that requires special handling, um, and I want to talk about about that briefly too. Next, please. Um, so, you know, you want to segregate them, you want to mark and label them, you want to make sure you're using containers in good condition. Uh, DOT regulated containers for those that are actually hazardous waste or flammables, keep containers closed, keep waste under cover. So these, these are all good practices as people might, 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 uh, might guess. Next, uh, here's an example of labeling of a non-hazardous waste. So a waste that does not meet the federal definition of hazardous. Next, uh, and there's a couple here, you can just click through them on these. So you, uh, I, I, one, one, one bullet on this one, I think that's a good takeaway is if you're gonna be disposing in the sanitary sewer, you certainly wanna check with local or state requirements regarding disposal. You wanna understand if it's a sewerable material. And I know there's gonna be more talk about that. And you can see some typical non-hazardous waste here. Again, non-hazardous by definition of, of, of RECRA, not necessarily meaning it's still a regulated material. Next. Uh, so again, check with your sewer ordinance, as I said, keep things labeled. Next. Um, yeah, these can go through. You're going to just highlight these. And uh, hazardous waste require a special label. Folks have probably seen these types of labels, but it requires the generator's name, and it requires also why it's a hazard uh, listing and what the waste material contains. In this case, they showed it's a flammable liquid. They put a, a, a DOT flammable label on it. Next. Uh, there are special shipping papers that are associated with hazardous waste uh, called manifests um, for non-hazardous is also non-hazardous manifest. But if you're shipping hazardous waste, it has to be on a specific manifest. Next. Uh, specific labeling, as I've already indicated, uh, with special warning characteristics. Next. And these are some examples. Again, folks have probably seen in terms of uh, pictograms and uh, uh, NFPA, and et cetera. Next. Uh, used oils, I don't know that this group is a large used oil generator. Used oils require their own special handling. Uh, next. Uh, they require their own special labeling. And again, in many states, these are hazardous waste. In other states, these are regulated waste. Typically used oils do get recycled. They get burned off site for energy recovery. Next. 
Uh, here's universal waste, which is a, a subset, and I think is is a waste that's being generated by this group. That would include some of your lamps. It could include uh, lithium lead acid batteries, types of dry cells, rechargeable batteries, particularly could contain mercury containing equipment. There's not so much of that in the industry anymore. And aerosols are now allowed to be handled as universal waste. Next. Uh, you can accumulate them for up to one year, and it's important that you know how long you're accumulating, so you can't keep them forever, 12 month requirement. And you have to demonstrate that time. So if you're going to have a box, it has to be labeled. Next. And here's some examples of just, you know, they, they, they didn't really label the box. And, and it's, uh, you know, an example of what, you know, it's not labeled. Next. And again, so if you're going to have lamps and you're going to generate these lamps, you want to label them as used lamps. You want to have the date on them. You want to protect them from breakage. You don't, uh, so you want the packaging to protect them from damage. Next. Uh, there's some example of labeling of use, universal waste lamps. Next. Uh, you could have used batteries also, discarded batteries, also universal waste, next. Uh, and those have to be labeled and you wanna protect them from also some discharge requirements. You don't wanna have a fire with lithium ion batteries, next. Aerosol can be handled also as universal waste. These should not be mixed in the standard trash, next. Uh, there's again, some labeling you can, you can see these are, are consistent in terms of just identifying them as universal waste, next. All right, so here's some typical examples of universal waste as we indicated, and I'm mostly for this group, it's probably lighting, could be aerosols and batteries. Uh, also electronic equipment. So for spills and releases, you're required to have some emergency preparedness. Uh, it's not, doesn't have to be highly detailed, but you should have some emergency preparedness materials, some spill cleanup kits, et cetera. These are typical things that sites should, should have on site. Next. Uh, things like you can see fire extinguishers, uh, you know, spill control equipment, is there water, are there other controls, uh, do you have some absorbents and pads, et cetera, next. And here's the 10 most common record of violations. Again, these would be most applicable to an industrial site, but failure to mark a container, leaving a container open, uh, failure to manage universal waste, uh, storage beyond storage requirements. Uh, so really, you know, a, a lot of these also stem from people not doing good waste determinations at next. And here's some of the takeaways that I just wanted to share. And I, I apologize for going a little bit over the, on this, but you know, do your waste determinations, understand when you're generating a waste, how it needs to be handled. And this ranges the gamut all the way from something that's hazardous to, to recyclable, et cetera, the full gamut, document those. Manage if you have hazardous waste and universal waste, manage them properly, understand your requirements, utilize state information. A lot of the states have great websites, you can go right to your state, right on their website. They have lots of good material. They often have training materials and, and downloadable PDF type files. If you're gonna dispose in the sewer, confirm those sewer requirements and disposal requirements and do good recycling. And I know a lot of folks on this call are gonna talk about recycling, but manage your other solid waste and recyclables appropriately. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate that was you. That's pretty uh, fast. I, I apologize. Yeah, trying to do the Cliff Notes version. Yep, yep, Obviously, yep. a lot to cover there, but really appreciate that overview. You know, kind of generally for the industry. And now let's do a deep dive. You know, specifically talking for cannabis waste. You know, kind of generally, and then we'll we'll hear from operators there with those specifics. So, Jake, looks like you're all queued up. If you want to come on back. Fantastic. Thanks for having me, um, Vicente Saderberg. I really appreciate you setting this up. Um, thanks for that great introduction to overall waste there, Adam. That was that was really informative, and I'm, I'm definitely going to be reaching out for some help to some of my clients. Um, this is me, Jake Mitchell. Uh, I started off as a sustainability and climate action planning consultant for municipalities in the private industry before I moved into cannabis, um, and now I'm trying to, trying to bring that here. I work with Resource Innovations now. Um, we are a environmental consulting firm, so we do a whole bunch of different stuff, but I primary, I only work on cannabis, um, doing direct to customer sustainability work. So working directly with cannabis customers, then also um, executing utility programs for implementing energy efficiency into the cannabis industry. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so we're going to be talking about a bunch of stuff today. Uh, you know, I'm going to give you a waste overview on cannabis. We're going to talk about current cannabis waste policy, new policies that are coming out. Um, or have come out that have changed the kind of scope of what you're allowed to do, um, some common practices for cannabis disposal, and then finally get into some best practices uh, for cannabis waste. 
So uh, breakdown by facility. What are the most common things that we see in cultivations? Plant material is obviously one of the biggest, you know, the stalks and the fan leaves, um, the stuff that you can't use in production very readily or easily. Uh, soil or soilless mixes, so like Grodan and uh, a Grodan rock wool. That's just a, a brand name, sorry, but rock wool is the actual product. Um, you know, cocoa coir, uh, other like hydroponic soilless mixes. Uh, a lot of those are used once and then thrown into the waste. Um, soil, not as much, especially if you're doing a living soil, but um, we see that as well. Uh, and you got to do that 50 50 mixed materials, which all go over. And then, you know, standard solid waste like Adam was getting into. So, packaging equipment, um, like lights being thrown out or fans being thrown out once they're they're dead, uh, PPE, like gloves and masks and Tyvek suits, um, then like your standard office waste. And then we do see some hazardous discharge, um, you know, nutrients and pesticides in the water stream and also, you know, just getting rid of the, the residuals of those chemicals. Um, in processing, we do see a, a really unique type of waste, flammable hazardous waste, because most of these um, processing centers are using like a butane or a propane or something flammable as the solvent to get these products out. Um, and then, you know, the standard solid waste that I went over for cultivations also kind of applies packaging, equipment, PPE, less lights, more, more other, um, other chemicals used in the, the processing world. And then hazardous discharge, like isopropyl and sal solvents. Um, you know, a lot of isopropyls used for cleaning these machines, and sometimes it doesn't get disposed of properly. Hopefully it does. Um, and then in retail, primarily packaging on the consumer side, um, which is kind of, it's in the retail realm, but it's also on the consumers. So that's kind of a tough one. Um, and then the standard solid waste that you'd see in any kind of retail setting, you know, packaging for the products coming in, any equipment that dies or goes bad, PPE, a lot of people wear gloves when they're, you know, packing joints or doing whatever, um, and then just standard office waste. I'm going to go to the next one. Yep. Um, okay. So waste policy in cannabis. So this was most waste policy was based off original legalization states. So like Colorado and Washington, um, we immediately adopted something called the 50, 50 rule, which was that you had to mix your cannabis waste. So fans and stocks, uh, fan leaves and stocks and mix it with another media to make it unusable and unrecognizable uh, for human consumption. So that means mixing it with a lot of people mix it with soil, a lot of people mix it with office waste, a lot of people mix it with, um, you know, whatever they have lying around soil, uh, cocoa coir, rock wool, you know, whatever, whatever they can mix it with to make it 50 50. Um, and then you also have to, I mean, you have to abide by the standard waste policies as well set out um, by the state and by the EPA. So you have to abide by those while also um, taking care of these extra caveat, caveats. Uh, sent, they're mostly, in most cases, it's sent to solid waste facilities. So landfills um, is where most of these 50-50 mixes end up. Um, they're just sent along with the rest of your trash um, from the facility. Uh, composting is becoming more available. Uh, a lot of states are starting to do it, like Colorado just were this year we're allowed to now compost, or last year, beginning of 2021, we're allowed to compost. Um, so a lot of people have been picking it up, but until last year, it, it wasn't even allowed. You couldn't even get past the regulations to make it happen. Um, I did. I do know a few facilities that ended up doing it, but I'm pretty sure they were zoned for agriculture was the way that they got around it. Um and then uh, packaging, recycling, and take backs are becoming more widespread as well. Brandon uh, and I are actually working on a, a pilot recycling program right now with the City of Denver's Sustainability Work Group. Um, so we're doing some some cool stuff there. But it is it is becoming more available to do better things with your waste than just throwing it in a landfill and mixing it um, mixing it up. Um, so here's an example of a poor cannabis waste disposal. I don't know how that font got kind of messed up. Apologies for that. Um, but the, the cannabis plant is grown. Plants are harvested and the buds are trimmed. Um, stocks and fan leaves are ground up and mixed to 50-50 with pretty much whatever's lying around. Um, that mix is thrown in the dumpster with everything else. That dumpster is sent to the landfill. The materials are covered with soil in an anaerobic environment, specifically so they don't degrade and leach into the surrounding environment. And then the waste de decomposes over decades, if not century or millennia. Um, and you can see these, these other two down below. So, um, you know, this is the blue one is a processing and the orange one is a, 
um, is, is for retail. I won't spend too much time on these, so I don't go over our 10 minutes, but we'll provide all these slides and you can take a, a deeper, closer look at, at these kind of standard cycles that we see um, in, a, in a poor cannabis, uh, poor cannabis waste model. These are kind of the standard cycles that we see, you know, packaging on the retail side and um, for uh, processing that, that flammable hazardous waste that I touched on, that has to actually be sent um, actually has to be sent out of state because in Colorado, we don't have a flammable hazardous, um, waste disposal facility. So it needs to go to a specialized facility, um, with specialized requirements. They have super thick concrete walls and they actually incinerate, um, get rid of that product through incineration because it is flammable. Um, so that's created a really interesting, um, a really interesting kind of mess here in Colorado that technically our, most of our processing hazardous flammable waste is actually sent to Nebraska. So there is cannabis material crossing the border going to Nebraska in order to get disposed of. Um, so that's created a really unique situation here. And then on the retail side, um, you have that, uh, the packaging from the sellable units that the bud and other products are packed into and then the end user it's kind of up to their responsibility to get rid of that product in a good way. Um, you know, they obviously with more access to resources, it would become a more common occurrence. Um, but a lot of times that packaging just ends up in the landfill or getting sent to a recycling center where it might be accepted or it might be rejected. Um, and in 2019, as you can see, uh, 7.3 million pounds of marijuana plant waste was sent to landfill in Colorado. So that's all, all plant waste that could be biodegraded and broken down and, and used um, for nutrients later on. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so in an ideal approach, what are we looking at? So, you know, the, the plant is grown just like it was in the last one. Plants are harvested. Um, stocks and fan leaves are ground up and then mixed uh, to 50-50 with an organic matter. So the 50-50 the rule, rule does still apply in a lot of states, um, but you can mix it with organic matter instead. So that would be... Um, you know, any, uh, any kind of products that you have lying around that could be composted or any other processes in your grow that would allow, allow those products to be set to a composter. Um, the mix is comp picked up and composted locally with a company or used as livestock feed. A lot, of, um, a lot of companies are now sending this, the like stocks and fan leaves off to be eaten by cows um, and other livestock animals. Um, the compost is then used either from you know, those cows or from just a standard composting or industrial composting process um, is then used back in cannabis cultivations as a nutrient and you're creating a cyclical system. Um, on the processing side, using a kind of a solventless method instead of a solvent method, which isn't always possible, obviously, but um, doing that allows you to then mix that non-active cannabis waste with organic materials, send it to a composter, same rule applies. Um, and then from a retail perspective, um, the buds uh, are packaged into sellable units. The units themselves are composted, recycled, or reused packaging. The end user disposes of that packaging responsibly. Um, and then that packet, and then you're creating more of a cyclical system of that packaging is take back, take, taken back and reused or composted or recycled. Um, so this is kind of more of a, an ideal approach to the current waste methodologies we're seeing in the industry. Um, I know it's not always feasible for everybody. And I know this is kind of a pie in the sky ideal approach, but it's, it is, you know, these examples would create a more cyclical system for the industry. Um, next slide. Um, so what are the, what are the current biggest impediments to a more sustainable waste system in cannabis? Um, one is packaging requirements. Brandon and I were actually talking about this before this meeting. Um, you know, that would be things like childproofing requirements, um, you know, are, are a huge impediment. And I, I definitely speak for myself when I say this and, and not for anyone else on this webinar. I'll leave, leave it up to them if they want to say it. But I, I personally don't agree with um, some of the strictness in the childproofing laws, which would which do cause quite a bit of issue in what packaging you can or cannot cannot utilize. Um, so packaging clients, waste disposal policies, so some states still don't even allow you to compost. Um, cultivator education, a lot of cultivators aren't aware that there's a better way that they can do these things. Um, there's, they're not aware of uh, that even they're allowed to do these things. I mean, half the, half the cultivators that I work with, um, even if they're in a state that allows composting, they haven't even heard that it's a feasibility and they wouldn't even know where to start if it was. 
um, consumer education. So, you know, consumers understanding what they can do with their packaging, what's available to them. Can they take it back? Can they recycle it? Where can it be recycled? Getting that education in the hand of consumers. So those end products aren't um, just going straight into the landfill and then financial barriers and market pressures. And so that's, um, you know, if you don't have the money to, <laughs> to, pay an employee to set up a composting program and dig through the regulations and figure out what products they need to mix it with and who to pick it up. Um, you know, that, that's all, um, that's all financial and, uh, based on market pressures too. If, if you're f focused on getting, you know, a bunch of pounds out because the price per pound has dropped cannabis or composting is going to be the least of your worries. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, that's it. So that's my presentation. Um, and I appreciate everyone taking the time to listen. And if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Great, thank you. And um, I will just jump back in to answer one question in the chat. These slides will all be going out at the end. Uh, usually gives us a couple of days to package everything, but the slides will go out uh, with everyone's contact information after the webinar is over. Uh, so thank you, Jake, really appreciate that. And Brandon, you're up. Um, and then after that, Garrett, and then we'll leave some time. There have been a few questions that have rolled in. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks for uh, Vicente Sedeberg setting this up. I think these are <clears throat> super valuable in our industry. It's still an emerging industry, um, even though it's been legalized in certain states for about a decade now to certain degrees. It's still um, a lot of burdens on operators to figure some of this stuff out. Uh, some of the local state regulations vary a lot as you move around, um, but there are a lot of great resources out there, as Adam and Jay kind of pointed to. So I'll kind of uh, focus a little bit more on kind of the operator challenges of some of the more on the ground things that they talk about, um, but really appreciate that feedback. It makes it a lot easier for me. <laughs> um, so the first thing to touch on is uh, the organic waste. Um, again, we're a vertically integrated company, so grow um, post harvest MIP all the way to stores. Um, and on, you know, it varies depending on how, if you're just a retail side, obviously you have a little bit limited scope on this. Um, doesn't mean it's any less complicated, um, but on uh, the organic waste side, the biggest one's gonna be for cultivations, uh, like Jake talked about, uh, that flow chart I think is really helpful and something that operators should really do is to really understand the different kind of breaking off points of things as they get processed through the different stages and where those can go compliance wise and where's the most ideal places for those to go sustainability wise. Um, but it's really critical to make sure those operations are really built in that you know employees are trained, that SOPs are developed, um, and it's just really built in that, you know, you segregate certain waste streams, um, you want to make sure it's going the right way. Uh, we're a very highly regulated industry. Um, as, you know, Adam pointed to a lot of the different things you might not think about right off the top of your head, those still apply. Our regulations on a state and local level are very detailed, but they don't capture all of that in there. So sometimes you have to dig a little bit deeper to find those answers and those resources. Um, and on the, you know, the MIP side, you still have some uh, organic waste you can deal with there. Again, some of those have to go than the other. Um, and then on the store side, probably a little bit less impactful for organic waste, um, but you do have to like destroy product and do the 50-50 the mixture that Jake was talking about. Um, so you still have to be aware of those kind of requirements there. Um, and I've always emphasized you want to start from a place of compliance and then uh, build the most ideal sustainable options from there. Um, but obviously if you're doing stuff wrong and you're getting fined and shut down, then it's kind of hard to improve your operations over time. So you want to start with that and make sure you're doing things properly. And then get a little bit more um, as you put a pie in the sky. But some of those things are becoming much more realistic, uh, especially here in Colorado. Um, I would say the MED has been fantastic with working with operators. Those rule changes that Jake talked about for organic material and allowing composting, anaerobic digestion, things like that are a huge benefit. Um, not necessarily rolled out in a huge scale yet within the industry, but it's still the knowledge of that allowance is still getting around. Um, so I think in Colorado, they do a great job of that. Um, and, you know, just being aware of those local regulations as well. Um, the next thing, um, and I'll, I'll kind of be quick on this one, but I, I love talking about this. So if Jake and I have piqued your interest on consumer containers and recycling and that kind of thing, definitely throw some questions in the chat. Um, there's a, a lot of different materials that can be used. And the, you have to really think of the end of life scenarios for those, whether it's reuse, recycling, composting, if it just needs to go to the landfill, um, things like that. It's really good to plan that in from the start of your supply chain. And then um, it, it does, like Jay kind of alluded to, fall a little bit more on operators. Uh, 
Colorado doesn't have the best recycling rates. Um, I think it was pretty well known um, in the news of late. So I think there's a lot more that could be done on that kind of municipal government level. But in the meantime, I think operators can be ahead of the curve. Uh, like Jake alluded to, we are working on a recycling pilot for Denver um, to kind of capture some of these smaller containers that even if they are recyclable, they aren't necessarily recycled because they're small, they're really heavily labeled, so they just aren't pulled out of the, the waste stream. I like this picture just because I think it's a, a good demonstration. Like if you're trying to find an eighth or a gram file in there and pull it out, it would just be like a where's Waldo thing, especially with the quick conveyors moving along and things like that. Um, so, you know, a lot of the in-house options that are available can be worked out. That's what we're hoping to really prove with this pilot that you can you know, bring containers back to dispensaries, have a single or multi-stream to a processor and make sure those things are reused, recycled, or if you know, they need to go to the landfill, that they go there. Um, but you know, it's very complex to do, but we're hoping to figure that out. And I think long run more infrastructure in that uh, will definitely be helpful. Uh, next slide. And then I'll be quick on this one because I think Adam did a fantastic job of going over this. Um, but I think this is important to remember just because like, so you think of the obvious stuff, the, you know, the plants, uh, the grow medium, uh, the consumer containers, that's really kind of intuitive in the industry, but just because you're in this uh, regulated industry doesn't mean you aren't covered by other regulations. Um, so those might not necessarily be outlined in Colorado with the AMED regulations. It's not going to point out every detail like Adam talked about there even, but those resources are available, um, whether it's, you know, reaching out to government officials, reaching out to consultants, um, just doing your own research. Uh, it's really good to be proactive about this. I know as you know, in an industry that is very highly regulated, and we feel like regulators are always very much uh, paying attention to us with a microscope. It's hard to reach out and be like, ask questions and kind of get on their radar unnecessarily, but it's way better to be proactive about this. Um, you don't want to be asking forgiveness instead of permission on these kind of things because um, they do affect public health. And these are very important things to make sure you're disposing of properly. Um, and if you're doing it wrong, somebody's probably going to catch you eventually. And uh, it's not a good look, um, especially, for, like I said, an industry that we're still emerging. So we want to really play above that line and set a good standard. Um, next slide. So yeah, that's kind of a quick overview. Like I said, I try to usually be brief because I love the Q&A sessions. So uh, anything new you want to ask about, feel free to throw it out there. Thanks again for the time. Thank you. All right, uh, Garrett, to round out the panel before we then hop to some of those questions that have been coming in. It sounds good. Uh, thank you, uh, Vincent Setterberg, for hosting, and thanks for everyone uh, tuning in, uh, showing interest in cannabis waste management. I uh, love to talk about it. Uh, next slide. So um, I know Adam and Jake and Brandon um, really gave a lot of information and kind of highlighted on, on a few different um, challenges or issues. The challenge that I want to kind of highlight today is the uh, the requirement for uh, operators to handle their waste and essentially uh, treat their waste on site into an unrecognizable and unusable form. Uh, this is a requirement that is uh, a little unusual and, and waste treatment is typically a permitted activity. Uh, so without clear uh, definition um, of, of cannabis waste and, and how to achieve that end result, it becomes a, a challenge. So kind of highlighted three uh, three items that uh, become a challenge for operators, limited and unusable space, insufficient mean, means and methods, and lack of knowledge and expertise. <clears throat> um, next slide. So our solution, and, and not, uh, you know, not to say that you have to use a service provider like us, we are a cannabis waste service provider, uh, using any, uh, any third-party service provider, I wanna, I wanna highlight the benefits of using a waste management service provider um, that can provide a comprehensive program and provide a lot of uh, expertise and knowledge and uh, just overall, uh, you know, best management practices and helping operators meet the requirements. So we've kind of broken into five um, slides, which will be the next five slides of this presentation, uh, written operating procedures, waste profiling, uh, generation, on-site treatment, and final disposal and documentation. Um, again, working with a, an experienced and licensed service provider uh, will help maintain compliance with regulations, uh, environmental health and safety, and really allow the operator to focus on what they do best, which is you know, producing, selling, uh, manufacturing uh, cannabis or marijuana products. Uh, next slide. 
So waste, waste SOP is the first uh, in this in this step of creating a comprehensive waste management program. And SOP is a written document that uh, outlines the internal processes and procedures and safely and compliantly managing waste. Uh, details uh, waste streams that are generated at the facility, uh, what, what types, how much, how they'll be accumulated and stored. Um, different quantities and volumes, uh, storage, uh, timeframes, um, and essentially from, from start to finish, generation to disposal. Uh, it's oftentimes uh, typical for a waste coordinator to be appointed to oversee the plan, uh, keep it relevant, updated, um, aid in its implementation, and train employees on its function. Uh, a lot of companies uh, that are going through this process are new and their operations are changing um, you know, on a week or monthly basis. So keeping these plans up to date is, is really critical. Next slide. Uh, second would be waste profiling. So again, identifying uh, waste streams that are uh, generated at, at a facility. Uh, this, is, this is talking more about hazardous versus non-hazardous uh, universal waste. Um, again, a, a, a service provider can assist in this process of, of profiling waste, making, helping to make the determination. As, uh, as Adam mentioned, you know, it is the generator's responsibility to make the determination either through um, generator knowledge, or uh, material safety data sheet or um, uh, laboratory testing. So again, a third party can help make that determination, help identify uh, waste streams that are uh, you know, potentially hazardous or that may be hazardous. Um, and then again, set up a profile so that those waste streams can be properly disposed of. Um, as you can see, all uh, facets of the industry, uh, and this is kind of more California-based uh, cultivation manufacturing, distribution, retail, and testing lab, uh, all generate some form of hazardous uh, and some form of non-hazardous waste. Um, again, we, we do say that not all cannabis waste is hazardous, but all cannabis waste is regulated. Uh, and the last point at the bottom there with the EPA and DTSC, uh, DTSC or the uh, Colorado, I think, Department of Public Health and Environment, um, Again, they, they may have stricter guidelines that may supersede state cannabis rules and regulations. So um, it's important to make sure that, you know, you're not inadvertently violating one regulation by trying to uh, abide by another. Uh, next slide. Uh, waste generation. Uh, so again, uh, a third party service provider can assist in this process as well, uh, providing containers, proper containers for, uh, for waste accumulation helping to uh, segregate and uh, segregate waste streams for uh, downstream uh, disposal, uh, providing covered, labeled, uh, secured containers, um, you know, assisting in, in identifying a, a, an area, suitable area on the licensed premises to store waste. Um, just some general things. Uh, designated waste storage area should be uh, easily accessible, secure, uh, durable in construction, um, maintain secondary containment in case of leak or spill and be under uh, video surveillance. Uh, next slide. So this, this shows uh, two photos, kind of two, uh, two scenarios that, that we've seen. Um, again, this, this, is, uh, this is an important slide and goes back to the on-site waste treatment um, and really is, is is really the main challenge that operators face in, in, in having to compliantly dispose of their waste. Uh, the photo on the left is, uh, is a photo of actually of our operations and, and is a, a mobile destruction method. Uh, that that uh, inventory has gone through a, a mobile uh, mechanical grinder and been shredded to about a quarter inch. And then on this other side, uh, we have a, a photo of, uh, the, an operator's uh, attempt to render their own waste. Again, without a lot of uh, instruction and, and direction, the operator essentially threw everything in, uh, mixed some paint. Uh, we got a combination of batteries, packaging, um, you know, really, uh, really did their best like, to, uh, to render this material, but kind of inadvertently created a, uh, a, a hazardous and very, very difficult uh, waste stream to dispose of. Uh, when you have organics mixed with batteries, mixed with paint, uh, as you can imagine, it becomes a mess. Um, so this is a challenge, you know, uh, 
requiring operators to treat their own waste on site and kind of giving an end goal, but not really an outlined process to achieve that goal is, is, is can be very complicated, especially with the diversity of waste streams that we see in the industry. You know, we see everything from food waste to, uh, you know, consumable goods to agricultural waste, uh, laboratory waste, uh, in some cases, even, even medical waste. Um, so those, those waste streams all, as you can imagine, require very different processes to you know, properly and compliantly render those unrecognizable and usable. It's, it's hard to find a, a, a one size fits all destruction. Um, and some stories that we've, we've heard in the industry, uh, operators reaching out to you know, local enforcement agents, um, you know, asking for some direction. And uh, we've, we've heard you know, of operators being told to you know, mix with, with cat litter and bleach, um, even in some instances mix with alcohol. Um, just, you know, kind of mixed, mixed signals, if you would, and, and uh, you know, leaving operators uh, kind of, uh, you know, without, again, without means and methods and, and uh, knowledge and expertise, uh, kind of setting them up for, uh, for failure. Um, so again, uh, kind of uh, the importance here of, of working with an experienced service provider that has the equipment, uh, the means and methods of, uh, of achieving that goal. Uh, next slide. Uh, the final part of this puzzle would be waste disposal. So final disposal of rendered cannabis waste. Again, uh, rendered cannabis waste should be disposed of at a permitted uh, solid waste facility. So landfill, composter, digester, uh, transfer, recycling, I think pyrolysis, uh, gasification is also uh, uh, permitted as well. Um, uh, again, a shipping manifest, uh, certified weight ticket may be required and uh, record keeping. Um, again, importance of working with a, a service provider really would be the, uh, the, the separation and treatment of those waste streams downstream uh, allows them to, or upstream rather, allows them to be uh, more sustainably uh, disposed of uh, downstream. So if you imagine the photo that we saw on the last slide with the paint and the batteries and the organics, uh, imagine trying to dispose of that waste. It's going to be difficult, A, and, and not very sustainable. So if, if operators are uh, able to uh, segregate their waste and, and sort it um, at the point of generation, it becomes a lot easier and uh, just more, you know, uh, economically and, and, uh, and, you know, efficient to uh, dispose of it properly, uh, keeping consumer or keeping uh, compostables with other compostables, uh, recyclables uh, with other recyclables, uh, separating packaging, um, things of that nature. Uh, rather than just kind of throwing everything in and, and grinding it up. Um, next slide. Uh, That's just a final slide, a uh, little bit, a uh, little bit into us and and uh, and some of the things that we've done to to you know set industry standards. Uh, the first is a mobile on-site destruction. Um, that was a photo from from the previous slide. Uh, and you can see a photo of that truck there. I know that uh, we're not the only service provider with this mobile on-site destruction. And I know that Colorado regulations have, have, uh, have allowed for this service uh, as well. So um, again, uh, great, uh, great tool. Um, you know, if you are in touch with a, a local provider and they have a, a mobile on-site destruction, um, I know it's fast, it's, uh, it's efficient, it's, it's safe, it's quick. Um, and it really, uh, it, it gets the job done quickly. Uh, Second, law enforcement body cams. So video surveillance is obviously a huge thing in this industry. Um, uh, we, and I know a lot of other companies as well, wear uh, body cams to record the process. Uh, and those videos can be shared with clients. Uh, vape pen recycling program. Um, I know that uh, the Colorado uh, regulations have, have uh, allowed for this as well with their consumer uh, waste uh, take back. Uh, Gaiaca, uh, as a service provider, we've recycled, I think, about 10 million vape pens since 2017. Um, we've set up collection points at retail locations, uh, even household hazardous waste uh, facilities, uh, local landfills. Um, so that's a, a big, uh, big program for us. Um, and just in general, sustainable waste practices, again, managing waste, um, you know, upstream at the point of generation, really has a, a huge effect as waste, you know, makes its way downstream uh, to final disposal. And uh, finally, uh, training and consulting. Again, working with a, a service provider, 
uh, and just having the uh, the knowledge and expertise uh, in cannabis waste management, it's it's uh, it's what we do after all, and and uh, kind of alleviates you know that pressure and that burden from uh, from an operator that really wants to focus on their uh, their business model. So um, I would say leave it up to the professionals. Um, if anybody has any questions or wants to reach out to me directly, uh, please feel free. Happy to uh, to uh, answer any questions or uh, put you in touch with uh, with someone from our team or uh, another service provider uh, locally in your area. So thank you guys. Awesome, thank you. And maybe if we can just switch to the last slide with everyone's contact information in case people wanna copy that down. And obviously a lot of content to cover in a compressed amount of time. So it looks like we've got a few questions rolling in. So if I can ask everyone to come back and we can just kind of try to hammer out all these, I'm sure there'll be plenty of follow-up questions as well, but maybe first question, um, I'm not sure who on the team would like to take it. So throwing it out there. First question, um, you know, for all of this waste tracking that we're talking about, is there any particular software you'd recommend or any particular methods or methodologies that would work well to be tracking waste? Um, I, can, I can touch on that. Uh, for, in terms of software, um, I would probably recommend whatever reporting system that you use for your state. So like most states use metric um, that actually requires you to input your waste. So it's pretty easy to pull up your, at least plant waste, not necessarily your, um, not necessarily all the rest of your waste. If you really want to get a good look at all of your waste going out, um, I would recommend doing a, a waste audit um, to actually determine the pounds of waste that are going out of the facilities so that, that entails actually just weighing the, the bags of waste going out um, and taking a keeping good record of those. Um, I usually set my clients up when we when we implement a waste tracking system with a um, Excel sheet um, or an Excel document to kind of keep tracking that waste as they move forward and then they just input it each month. Um, you can make those look really pretty um, and nice, but I'm, I'm not familiar with any specific waste tracking software. Um, that I use, that anyone uses. Okay. I'll just say that some states do provide waste determination uh, worksheets. So if you want to just do simple waste determinations and have them written and therefore documented, which is what you want, some of the states have a form that you can just use and you walk through the type of waste. Is it hazardous? Is it non-hazardous? Well, how did you make the determination? You know, et cetera. And you could do that for each one of your waste streams. You could certainly do that for plant waste, non-hazardous waste, and other waste. It doesn't have to be specific just for hazardous waste. Great, thank you. Um, and a question coming in for those that operate in multiple sites, potentially you know, across multiple state lines, is there the ability to set up one program for how you handle waste, whether it's cannabis THC waste or universal waste, or does it really have to be state specific, local specific? It usually has to be state or local specific. Each state is going to have its own guidelines for how you're supposed to process that waste and deal with that waste. Um, a lot of them are very similar. So you can definitely tr um, take a look at all the states you're operating in and compare and contrast the different regulations that you're dealing with in those two states and try to come up with a standard operating procedure. Um, but at the end of the day, there is a lot of, uh, there's that state level and then the local level too. Like even um, you have to abide by local ordinances. So like in Oklahoma, for example, um, you're actually allowed to like burn your, your cannabis waste on property. Um, but you're only allowed to do that if you're in an area that allows the burning of waste, right? So if your facility is in the middle of a city, you probably can't burn it out back. But if you're like in a rural agricultural reason, re, um, area, you probably can, can incinerate it. So, um, I I'd say it's, it's something that you really need to look at, um, site by site or state by state. Okay, makes sense. And I guess with that state by state approach, um, are there any states that stand out in terms of promoting composting or minimizing the environmental footprint? Um, I know each state's trying to do their own thing, but is there even anyone looking kind of as compared to each other that it stands out for innovating or pushing the envelope as much as other states? Gary, you might have a, a better, uh, better handle on that than I do. I would say Colorado, look, looking at Colorado regs uh, in comparison to California, I, I, I hope that California can catch up to, uh, to where Colorado is right now. Um, 
the DCC, you know, just released a set of emergency regulations that I think will go into effect uh, soon after this public comment period. Um, but uh, yeah, Colorado, uh, I, think, I think you guys uh, really hit it out of the park with waste regs. Yeah, I know Massachusetts allows you to compost. Mm -hmm. I know Oklahoma allows you to compost. Florida. Um, Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Washington allows you to mm -hmm. now as well. Um, I think you can compost and do um, anaerobic digesters in Alaska. Um, you know, any anyone, any state that basically allows composting um, or take back programs, I would say is ahead of the curve. Okay, thanks for that. Um... All right, let's see. Um, to answer Amy King, no, going to ask your question right now. Uh, do the experts on the panel think the lack of understanding or compliance with waste management is because the cannabis industry does not operate under GMP or GAP mentality? Because with G, uh, GAP or GMP, there's a clear understanding of waste planning. So I guess kind of general question, why do we think there might be a gap of understanding uh, in this industry? I think part of it is just, you know, it's not federal legalization, each state's kind of doing things a little bit differently. Um, I will say in Colorado, we are trying to move towards more of a GMP model um, for, you know, testing and certain things like that. I think that's kind of the goal is to not try to reinvent the wheel and use some of these resources that are even figured out. But um, it also doesn't, you know, just boilerplate fit perfectly um, to every market the same. So uh, I think using those in the long term is a good way to continue to build the fundamentals in the industry, but you know, I also know just from being like in the the ASTM uh, subcommittees and things like that, I feel like there's a lot of good back and forth. Like some of the stuff going our way, it's obviously very informative, but also kind of some of the insights that maybe those experts on the on GMP models and things like that haven't um, considered exactly in our space, whether it's you know tweaking definitions and things like that. Um, so I think that is a good long term goal, and I will say Colorado is making an effort to kind of move in that direction. Um, but, you know, federal, federal legalization would probably be the biggest, easiest way for that to go into effect, but that doesn't necessarily mean it would go smoothly, um, be the easiest thing to do. And I assume we're, we're talking about good manufacturing processes when we talk about GMP. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is just, it's not like most cannabis cultivators and cannabis business people coming into the space aren't um, necessarily coming, you know, from an MBA or the manufacturing world where they're aware of these different processes and procedures that they can put in place to become more sustainable and environmentally friendly. And it's up to each company individual to individually to take that, that on and learn about it on their own and implement it. I mean, we can do all these webinars that we want, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's up to those cultivators to, to figure that out. Right. And one other comment I guess I would make is, you know, the waste regulations and the waste regulatory framework, especially the stuff I was talking about, goes back decades and predates the entire cannabis industry. So, you know, definitions of hazardous waste have been on the books for years and things like universal waste. These are not new concepts. So now we're having a new industry uh, having specialized regulations, but also these other regulations exist and they and they are and they are also applicable. So it's, it, it's, it, it's not exactly that you're gonna go just to the cannabis regulatory framework and, and find all your answers. Uh, it, it, a lot of that stuff is, is, is standing outside and affects all industries who generate waste. Gotcha, and I know we're running tight on time. So many, maybe one more question that kind of ties this together. Um, so New York is proposing some very strict uh, environmental standards and conjunction with the environmental agencies in the state. So one question that's coming in, so will New York environmental agencies and have we seen it in any other state make sure that those licensed cannabis business receive guidance or education um, or is it really up to the individual operators to go out and seek this information? Kind of kind of ties into the last question, but how much uh, guidance can someone passively sit back and hope to receive from a state agency or how much do they need to actively go seek out the information? I, mean, I, I would always, always, always encourage self-research when it comes to your facility, your operations and what you want to do with it. If you want to, um, 
be more sustainable in your waste systems, then then you need to research it and look into it and take that on, um, regardless of, of what the government is working on. I would surely hope that NYC, uh, New York, if they're putting like strict new regulations in place, that they'll be providing information to the cannabis um, companies within that are under the framework of that regulation. You know, I, I really hope that they do. And I think that would be fantastic if they did. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of people aren't going to, even if that those resources are provided, I think a lot of companies aren't <laughs> going to look at them because um, you know, getting stuff, you get a lot of stuff from the government agencies working in cannabis and it's, it's hard to sift through all of it. But additionally, it's, it is something that I think that cultivators should, it, it comes with, it comes with the job, you know, an environmental health and safety manager at a manufacturing plant needs to know the regulations that concern them um, and needs to know how to respond to them appropriately. That, that's on the employee and the, the business itself, um, unfortunately. So. Sure, I appreciate that. I know there's a few more questions that we didn't have time to. I'm not gonna uh, hold our panelists hostage and answer every last one. So I do apologize, but please definitely follow up um, either with myself and I can get the question to the right person or if you have a good idea to any of these panelists, but apologize we didn't have time, but a lot of content to cover in a short amount of time. So please reach out. And I really do wanna thank everyone who was able to participate today, both in the audience and obviously our panelists as well, Garrett, Jake, Adam, Brandon, really appreciate your time um, and your attention. And there's gonna be a lot more content out there after this and coming up. I feel like each uh, each one of your PowerPoints could have been about uh, three hours longer, uh, maybe Adam's two hours longer, but everybody else um, really appreciate all your time and attention. And obviously huge wealth of knowledge here on this crew. So please reach out those in attendance with any questions and all of these slides will be sent to you afterwards. Thanks everyone. Have a good All day. Right. Thanks Thank everybody. You. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.